thank you very much. Thank you for uh, inviting me here. I really appreciate it and appreciate all of you guys are coming here. I know it's, uh, you might have a busy day uh, on Monday, a lot of things uh, going on. And uh, the topic for today, like uh, Simon was saying, is about how we can do uh, things uh, better when it comes to uh, security. And uh, just to, uh, just to understand who you guys are and uh, how much familiar you are around the identity side, you work with it, or are you, uh, how many of you are working with identity on a normal basis? Uh, yeah. And uh, who are from the infrastructure side uh, of the uh, Azure side, who work with on the, uh, on the infrastructure side? All right. And developers? Yeah. That's very good. So a mixed audience. That's very good. Thank you. So <clears throat> when I started to work with the, uh, the cloud, I was really amazed about the uh, how many roles that are in there. Uh, so coming from an Active Directory world where you only have four roles, basically, you could be an enterprise admin, a domain admin, uh, you could be a, a local administrator or user and moving into the Azure where you have six or seven hundred different roles. That is a monster, uh, I would say. So that's why we need to have a framework to work with where we basically ensure that our users, or our admins, or even our customers, or if you're a consultant and working with your customers, that you need to have a framework to do that. And Secondly, we need to have a way to scale this framework uh, so that we can deal with both on-premise and cloud, if it's a Microsoft cloud or even a multi-cloud scenario. So we need to do that. And the other thing which this uh, session here is about is how we can move from doing a delegation on a permanent basis to a more time-based uh, uh, setup. And uh, I wrote it here because I can and move it to um, just enough, just in time set up. So this session here is all about, you know, how we can get in control with who, what, when, and how. So my name is Morten and I'm from Denmark. And uh, I would say that I'm really a big fan of Microsoft. You can probably see that. Uh, I'm a security MVP. I'm also an Azure hybrid MVP, uh, and uh, so it's uh, security and Azure is uh, what I do every day, uh, and uh, it's really fun uh, to do that. And uh, one of the things that I spend a lot of time is also to work with the product teams and giving feedbacks. And I really encourage you guys to become part of the Customer Connect program if you're not part of that program already. I really encourage you to, to be part of it uh, and give feedback, work with the team, test new features, and uh, it's really, really cool to be part of. So uh, we're just going to touch a little bit around the uh, framework uh, called RAMP, uh, a little bit around that, and then we're going to zoom in on parts of the RAMP model where we're going to talk about the delegation uh, model. Uh, and then lastly, I'm going to show you some uh, cool demos, uh, especially around PIM, some things that I've built uh, that I'm going to provide to the community later on this year. Uh, so what you're going to see today is not something that you can download. I'll be happy to share it with you uh, if you want to have it, but I'm waiting for some new features to be uh, released soon. Uh, and then I will share everything that you're going to see today to the public. One of the things that I'm also going to share to you is something which a lot of my customers are really happy about, which is PIM for Active Directory. So how you can do that. So I'm going to show you a little thing about that. <laughs> so I have also brought a few things from Denmark. And uh, I'm going to uh, ask a, a little question along the way. So uh, if you... Uh, if you are winning this, you're getting a little optimist. And uh, this is a small Danish thing uh, to make 
world a little more joyful. So it's like a jiggling thing here to have to keep it on your table. So uh, yeah, it, and being a Dane in Sydney is special to me because of the Opera House. You probably know that uh, that it was a Dane who designed it. So that's uh, really, really cool to be here. Yeah. So the ramp model is um, basically a checklist. Uh, from Microsoft, which will uh, help you to get in control or get your customers in control with your environment and to to zoom in on things that are cru crucial to make the environment secure. And you can see here, these are the topics where you want to separate and manage the privileged accounts. You want to set up monitoring of the Active Directory. We want to improve the credentials management. And lastly, we want to protect the machines from where we do the management of our environment. So I'm not going to go into all of these. I'm going to zoom in on this. But I just want to briefly touch on a few slides where you can see what are the key topics of the RAMP model. So the first one is around the emergency access accounts. When we set up PIM and we set up the whole delegation model, we want to make sure that we do have a fallback plan or an emergency plan with break glass, glass accounts so that we can get access to this. And for each of these slides, and I'm going to prepare, I'm going to show you the link of the presentation later on, so you can download it directly. So there's going to be a QR code later on in the presentation, so you don't need to to, uh, to uh, copy everything out here. So the emergency access accounts, uh, where we're gonna do the setup of that. We're gonna implement the, the PIM, and that is what we're gonna focus on today. Then we also wanna make sure that we get a good understanding on all the accounts that are being used for delegation, for the uh, service accounts, uh, you know, uh, manage identities, all these things. We want to get a, a good categorization I, and understand where it is being used. So that's also part of this. And then one of the things is also we want to make sure to separate the accounts and not having any accounts that are local on our AV and sync it out to our Azure. Uh, we want to separate these things out and we kind of touch on that as well. And then I recommend that you implement the uh, Defender for Identity uh, tool, which is a monitoring tool for your AD. And you can get, uh, so it basically sits on top of your domain controller and, and, on, and listens to whatever is going on, both from a network side and from a usage side, if anything is going on. And uh, so this is a service that I really encourage you to, to look at as well. Yeah, password reset, we want to uh, lock down and make sure. Um, and then MFA, so that would be obvious, but still it's a, a big problem out there. I know at least a lot of the smaller partners are struggling to get their customers uh, to implement the uh, you know, basic MFA. So I just heard of a customer that was hacked because they had a subscription in Azure and, uh, and the, there was one of the accounts that was not protected and they ended up with 500,000 euros for six days of Azure usage. That's a lot of money. So the hacker apparently got access to their account and connected to the Azure environment and deployed a, a huge environment in 69 regions. And the bill just uh, went crazy. So MFA should be obvious, but it's still a problem. Blocking the legacy authentication pro uh, protocols, you know, the POP3, the IMAP, all these things, uh, get rid of those is also part of your recommendation and the application consent process. And again, clean up account and sign-in risk. That is uh, also uh, important that we do and, uh, and understand uh, if we have any accounts that are already uh, being uh, hacked or used. And uh, 
I've seen that happen a few times, and uh, it goes really, really fast uh, if you are uh, having a, a hacker in the house. And lastly, we want to set up these machines so that when we are having a tiering model, we only can access tier zero uh, environments from specific machines. So I'm not going to touch on that, but that's also part of the recommendation. So. I was saying, let's zoom in on the enterprise and access and tier administration model. So I assume that you all know PIM, or you all okay with that, all of you? So we're going to skip that demo. So this, on the left side in the corner, this is kind of the legacy model, where we have a tiering model from an AD perspective, having a tier 0, 1, and 2. And the new model, so, so what, we, what Microsoft came up with was a new model which will move from just protecting the on-prem AD to also protect the uh, multi-cloud setup. So where we want to have a model where we can protect both the on-prem environment and also uh, the different uh, clouds that we have. And you can see here that there are some words on here where it says uh, control plane, management plane, data, workload plane. And that is the way to talk about the different environments uh, so that we have a, a way for us to, to, uh, to talk about. So when we're talking about the control plane, we're talking about the core of the Entra ID on the Azure ID, so that is where we ha have all our global roles, for example. And, and we're going to touch a little bit about this. The management plane is where we have our logging environment, our security environment. So this is a cross-reference to the management uh, of, the, of the core infrastructure. Then we have the data and workload plane. That is where we have our line of business applications and we have our data. So it could be, you know, exposing some data out to the business. So that's part of the data plane and the workload plane could, it's just basically, you know, our normal applications that we are using. And then at the bottom, you can see here that we have two tier two environments, which is users having access and application having access. So that means, for example, you can have a application you know, uh, for an integration purpose, where you have uh, maybe uh, some integration between two clouds or uh, two a customer and a partner, and, and, and you're getting or sending up data. And we do that here at the bottom. So this is, uh, the, from a high level perspective, the, the model. When we look at the different, when we talk about the cloud, there are a lot of different roles and delegations inside the cloud. So when we just look at the, you can see here it actually shows as Azure AD, uh, or it should have been Intra ID, but uh, you get the picture here. Intra ID by itself has 102 roles. So again, moving from AD, where we had four roles, and just moving into Intra ID itself is 102 roles. At the bottom, you can see that there are different cloud uh, systems uh, like uh, Intune, uh, Exchange, uh, Dynamics, uh, DevOps, uh, Power Platform. Each of these systems also has uh, a number of different roles. And I'm going to show a few of these uh, today. Inside Azure, how many Roles to 427, 427 roles inside the Azure resource environment. And that is changing, uh, I don't know, weekly, but at least monthly. So whenever a new service comes out, typically there will be a number of new roles that will be uh, coming out uh, along the way for this. And then lastly, we also have you know, third-party application that will also introduce these uh, new roles. Here are some examples of these roles, and this is 
a new one inside Defender. So if you go into the security portal today, you can actually enable some new Arbor roles inside the security portal, which will allow you to, to differentiate the permission, for example, Am I doing a security operation? Am I managing the security posture? Or am I managing the settings uh, inside the environment? So this is Microsoft's way of doing rights more specific instead of giving everyone security administrator permissions, or uh, so which is considered as a high privilege uh, compared, compared to this. So we can actually manage the security inside the Defender uh, even being more specific. This is an example from Intune. So instead of having Intune role admin, we can now add new uh, roles or set permissions for our admins uh, to be more specific inside the environment. This is from Exchange. Uh, I think there are probably 20, 20 plus uh, roles inside the Exchange environment. So again, we don't need all our admins to be exchange role admin or global role admin. We can make it even more specific uh, when it comes to this. So let's refresh 102, 427, 15, 20, you get the picture. Uh, it is uh, really uh, a monster here. And I could keep on you know, adding more to this. All these uh, environments also introduce uh, and we need to have a framework to, to deal with this uh, and, and naming conventions and stuff like that. And that's what we're going to uh, talk about now. So the picture I showed before did not include the tiering, but now you can actually see the tiering on the left side. So again, we have the tier zero, which is the um, privilege, high privilege roles which is managing our, that has permissions to manage our complete environment. So that's the global admin, the privileged role admin, and, and, and these types of accounts. One of the things you can also see is the conditional access is up here. So we don't want everyone to be able to manage the setting of our conditional access because that is pretty much our way to manage everyone connecting to the complete tenant. And moving down here to the tier one, we can see here we have the tenant root uh, over here, and it is somewhere between a, a zero and a, and a one. I would say it's probably more of a zero to me, the tenant root. But if we go into the mesh environment, then we can start to see words like landing zones, where we have the platform, and typically the platform is the uh, where we have the whole management environment. That's where we have our logging, uh, where we have typically our log analytics, our Sentinel, uh, we have the uh, security, and we have our connectivity uh, there, we have our identity there, that's all part of the platform uh, in the landing zone structure. And we need to, whenever people need to manage the management plane, they need to have certain permissions to do that. Uh, again, this is a cross uh, structure. It's a permission that goes across the whole environment and it could be just in the Azure environment, but it could also be in uh, other environments like AWS as well. So inside the uh, tier one, we also have the workload and the data plane. And, and that's where we uh, structure our line of business application and the applications and the data uh, along with the way. And then lastly, we have the tier zero out here which is the user access and the uh, app access. So again, if you remember the, the, the old way where we had a tier zero, one and two, we still have that here, but we have now five different ways of references to these uh, data. So we have the workload, the management, that is in tier one, and we have two uh, environments or connectivity in tier two. So we have five in here um, where we can 
the destructive data. I'm putting up some tiering acronyms here because you're going to see those in a few slides when it comes to my recommendations to you uh, around the uh, some of the naming to, to do this because we need to make sure that we make up uh, some good naming for this. All right, so let's try to to dig into some of the uh, principles and some examples of how I do it. And, uh, and it's, of course, up to you guys uh, to, to work uh, uh, home in your environment with your customers uh, about how you want to set it up. So the components that we use to set up this delegation, are we want to have a, a good naming convention. And I'm going to cover that uh, here later on uh, in a few slides. Then we're going to use the PIM uh, environment. Then we're going to use administrative units. Do all of you know administrative units, the purpose of it? So if you think of Active Directory, you, you have OUs where you're going to structure your users or your servers or your uh, computers in an OU. When Entra ID or Azure ID came out, uh, we didn't have the ways of organizing, it's kind of it was a flat structure where all users and groups were in a basically in a big box. So we needed a way to to organize the users and the, the clients into different uh, boxes, you can say, or administrative units, so that we can say, I'm responsible for managing all the users in Europe. And he is responsible for managing all the users in the US. So, for example, if you have the password reset or the group's administrator role, if I take a person and give him the, the group's administrator role, and I just do it as a global role, what does he have permission to do? He has the permission to give himself access to become a global administrator, as an example, or he can change the, the, uh, the groups for anyone. And if we use the administrator units and delegate the permission to, to, uh, to the person or the group of, of uh, admins, then they can only do groups administrator things on the users or the devices that are in that particular administrator unit. So, Administrative unit is a way for us to, to do proper delegations with some really um, global high role, like password reset and uh, groups administrator and, and uh, things like that. So here are some examples of some AUs that, uh, that I typically create. Uh, I could do it even more uh, differentiated and so instead of putting all the services or tasks uh, in one uh, AU, I could uh, make more uh, depending on the, how uh, the, the setup of the company uh, that I'm working with. Then lastly, we're also using uh, access reviews. Um, are you all familiar with the concept of access reviews? Access reviews. Um, to just to understand is typically something that I initially started working with with teams when teams came out. You know, we ended up having hundreds of groups inside our environment, and uh, we really needed the owners of the groups to take co responsibility of dealing with the membership of who is assigned to this team's group. So we set up uh, access reviews to do that. This way, we can uh, the Microsoft sends an email to the owners, for example, every six months, saying, "Are you sure that these people should still have access to this team's group?" And uh, where it really is important, I think, is for the externals, you know, for guests coming in. So that was one of the things that was there from the very beginning, and we can also do that for internal users as well, and that is especially useful if people are moving around inside the organization, but they still have access to all the old team sites. So we, but IT does not know about who should be part of this. It could be the project manager or the business 
you know, the, 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 the department owner who set up this team site that actually knows who's the best uh, for this group. So that is where access reviews come to, into play. And we have the same concept for PIM here. So we can actually make PIM um, and, and, and measure who is uh, having access to this. Have they uh, started up a, a eligible role or should it be removed? So I'm gonna show one slide about that later. So the way that I delegate uh, my typical environments are based on six different criteria. So if I, uh, for example, typically if we are all part of a department, you know, an IT uh, department. And so that is kind of the, the no way to do it in a, in a normal setup. Um, but uh, I also see a lot of companies are, tra are transforming into using more of a role structure that could be uh, like a, a SecOps or platform ops and, and, and uh, DevOps and all these different uh, roles. And they use these uh, wordings uh, uh, instead of referring to the more traditional department way to do it. <clears throat> then we have the, the uh, concept of services. So a service could be, for example, Intune, it could be SharePoint, DevOps, uh, AD, ProMark. Uh, it could also be task. So I'm responsible of doing compliance reporting. I'm responsible of doing uh, cost management, or I just need to have access to the cost management uh, portal or, the, or the, the data. Then it could also be the concept of needing access to resources. So instead of having access to a whole uh, you know, all the servers in my environment as a domain admin, I might just need to have access to a specific ERP server uh, as a local admin or uh, being uh, able to use that. So that is uh, also where you go and make it more specific. And lastly, uh, the concept of I'm responsible for a process inside the company. I could be the, the patch guy, for example. So, what I normally do is to add the concept of leveling or levels inside my designs. So when you think of a department in a small IT uh, company, in a smaller IT department, maybe with let's say 15 people, they're all part of the operation uh, of the 15 people. But we also know that out of these 15 people, some of them should have more commissions than others. So, but how can we do that? So we can do that by adding the concept of having a role level. And I use these uh, roles uh, when I do my design. So uh, L1, uh, L0, that would be the kings uh, that uh, of the environment, that would be the high privilege global role admin. And if you compare this with uh, an uh, old uh, AD environment, that would be the enterprise admin. And inside the Azure environment, it would be the, the global role, uh, the global administrator. Underneath the L0, we have the L1, which are the global role admins. That could be domain admins, the DNS administrator, or it could be one of these global roles out of the 102 roles that we have, the example, the cloud application administrator. And then we have a scope role admin. That could be a local administrator on a server or a sysadmin uh, on a SQL server, or it could be one of these 20 different exchange roles that you saw before, where you where you did delegate one of these roles to the to the use to the admin. And then moving on, we have the operator level, which it is probably equivalent to the user administrator or in the cloud, it would be the central operator. But you can see here it starts to become a little messy because uh, we're, we only have these four roles basically inside our AD. So uh, so where are the, 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 how do we differentiate? And here we have the password administrator on the AU called users Denmark or users US, which is the supporter level. And then we have the reader level, and that's typically maybe a manager uh, inside the, uh, the department who needs access to the cost portal or 
he needs access to the uh, KPI portal where we have the operations, uh, the security dashboards, uh, that could be a big uh, level for that. And then lastly, the, the user level. So <clears throat> moving into the, the admin account, again, we don't sync up the admin account from the on-prem into the uh, cloud. We, if we have different um, accounts. So as you can see here, the blue ones at the top are the ones for the internal admins, uh, where you can see here in my case, I have four accounts uh, here if I'm an internal admin. I have a, a tier zero, uh, which is a cloud, and, uh, and then I have a daily account, which is a tier one. Then I have two AD accounts as well, which are similar to this. So I have four accounts, uh, and I do the same thing for external as well. So where I have normal uh, externals are not tier zero, uh, but but they but they would have a tier one typically. And then lastly, it could also be an invited admin where he gets a role as a guest user into my environment and become delegated uh, that way. So again, for externals, we typically have five ways, to five types of accounts. For internal, we at least have four up here. And uh, of course, we also have our normal account uh, for uh, where we are a normal office user inside the environment uh, besides that. So these are just the admin accounts. These are some examples of naming conventions where we mix these things together and, and put in these different uh, acronyms uh, for, to show, for example, which uh, uh, control plane is responsible for dealing with this, uh, with this group. Is it, for example, entry ID or is it AD? Is this used for control plane, workday plane, management plane? And, and, and so this is an example of uh, how you could do it and how I do it. So for example, here you can see, this is a group where it is for an Intune L1 global role admin. It is part of the control plane because it is a global role. It is a tier zero. Um, uh, it, it, it's placed inside the tier zero and it's managed by entry ID. So here's another one where we move down the stack. This is for Exchange Online Organization Management. It is a scope role admin where you are now uh, working as an L2 instead of L1 up here, which is the global role. It is down in the workload data plane. It is in tiers one because now you're down inside the application uh, in, inside the workload. You can also have, for example, an AD. You have a service where you have, for example, the domain admin, the L1, and then you get the picture here, right? So some of them, are, you can say here, it says S underscore AD. And that is what, what I use to sync uh, and I'm going to use that later in the PIM for AD and, and show that to you. So now I'm going to show you uh, eight, nine slides with examples of names uh, where you can see here an example. This is one of my customers uh, having a fairly simple IT with a help desk and operation. They have a, a BI uh, department. So. And uh, where you have the different uh, uh, teams and you have the delegations in here. Here's an example of another one, which is a larger customer having uh, uh, more uh, roles inside the environment, like uh, DevOps, uh, AppOps, uh, platform operations, security operations. And again, we have the different levels inside the uh, naming so that we know that even in the SecOps, we have people that should have more permissions than others. Here's another example where we are seeing it uh, from the, the uh, um, 
the service category. So I'm just gonna, let me just zoom in here a little bit. Oh, I wish I could. Here we go. So here you can see some examples of names. For example, you have the, the plow. Sorry. This thing has a, a mouse as well. So you can see you have, for example, the uh, actual DevOps, where you have the global role, you have the collection admin, project admin, contributor, and so on. So different levels inside the naming. We have the uh, power platform at the top. Uh, it could also be Defender, Dynamics, different applications where you can add the, the structure of the different um, uh, levels that the application provides. So here's an ex here are some examples of resources where we can delegate permissions uh, to the admins or the users uh, for uh, getting permissions to this. I see more and more customers that are actually uh, introducing PIM for their end users as well. So that, uh, for example, um, uh, for example, the, I have a customer that would like to manage who can make changes to the account plan inside their ERP system. So they need to delegate into PIM in order to do that because these changes are, are uh, global changes. Uh, so they introduce that. And if you have an E5 license, you have access to this uh, off the box. Yeah, and patching as well. So, uh, and this is an example of the task that I was talking about. And for example, inside the Active Directory environment, we can have different tasks that we want to control who can do that. And as an example here, you can see that uh, you have, for example, group policy management. Am I responsible or can I do that on a domain level? Can I do that on a scope uh, just for the servers, for the clients, for the users? Can I manage users in my AD? Can I do group management inside my AD? And so on. So these are just examples of different tasks where I can delegate permission. And you're soon going to see how I can actually do this using Enter ID as initiator. So I can go into Enter ID and, and activate this uh, permission and over in my AD and get that permission. So this is a mix of cloud task see these up here has id uh, down here these are ad so it's a mix of this and again it could also be aws or any other cloud that that you want to uh, manage we have the aus we saw before here are an examples of some of these uh, admin accounts that we define and and set it up this is a way how I merge all these definitions into assignments. <clears throat> so this is part of me doing automation around this. So again, you have these six different definitions uh, where you have the, the, the roles, you have the tasks, you have the services. And now we are moving into the assignment part <clears throat> where I'm giving access to, uh, to the different roles I'm using the uh, type, I'm using group text in my way to reference this. So each of the groups, each of the services are actually just having a number or a name. And, and I'm using that as a reference to do the assignment so that I can change, of course, the naming of the actual group or the description or anything of the group uh, when I, uh, without breaking the, uh, the automation around it. And in here, you can see that we have a different, these are some department rights. For example, the department two are the support uh, team where I can decide that they get maybe some uh, roles as electricals. And uh, it could also be that I decide hey, they are getting this as an active uh, permission. So 
when they have activated the department group, then they automatically have the uh, actual uh, delegations. Uh, we can uh, have, yeah, that, that's up to the customer or the, the company to decide about. So again, here we have a mix of the different uh, services, tasks uh, that are assigned some permissions. Here, another example where we have the support team that are having uh, these uh, permissions, but just on the, this AU. Uh, and here are some other ones that are having some other permissions on the same AU. So again, we can decide what role and what group are having what permission. This is moving into Azure, where we have the, where we have the different uh, management groups, we have the tenant groups, where we decide what role uh, should, uh, what group should have what permission. And you can see here some examples. For example, here we have, uh, let's say, uh, row 20, which is uh, like the cost management, uh, or it could be here you have the cost management contrib contributor, or I'm responsible for the task called cost management. So I'm getting the cost management contributor on the ten group as an example. So here are some other, uh, so these tasks four and five, that is, uh, I have the rights to see the uh, security dashboards uh, that are in my log analytics environment uh, or the central environment. And that's where I define these permissions. So again, here are some examples of the assignments for the admin account. So again, these are the principles that I use and when I do it. And now I would like to move into to show some of this, uh, how I, I use it. All right, so if you have ever worked with PIM, you would probably agree that there's a lot of clicking around. Would you agree? So do, so do I. Say. So do I. So what I have found is the, that I, my customers, including myself, we need some extra things that could be really cool. And um, I tried to build some of that. And that is what I'm saying that I wanted to, to show you guys. So I have here a, a baseline management. And uh, let me just connect to the, the server here. So let me just do like this. So <clears throat> what you're going to see here is uh, purely built in PowerShell uh, only public modules uh, using Microsoft Graph. Uh, I have a PIM function library of 3,700 lines of code, and I'm going to provide it for free so you guys can uh, use it for free if you want. And uh, I'll be more than happy to help uh, to if you want to set it up in your own environment. So again, this baseline management, you can build it in any uh, platform. You can build it in DevOps. Uh, you can use it as PowerShell scripting if you have a smaller customer, or small environment. You can use uh, CSV files if that's sufficient for you. You can use a SQL database. You can use a storage account for repository. It really doesn't matter as long as you just have some tables and a way to uh, to mix these things together. Then you're fine. So, and this example here is pretty simple, uh, but uh, what I do here is that I set up these things and then I press the button. And one of the things that I'm, I'm uh, doing is setting up the policies because one of the things that I learned when using this uh, initially was that when you set up a, a PIM uh, assignment today, you're not actually controlling the policies. So each of the PIM assignments today actually has uh, policies where you enforce, for example, MFA, you enforce justifications and stuff like that. So it's very important that you actually automate this because it, there's, there's no way to manage that out of the box like a template. So, uh, so that's why I loop these things uh, through uh, using this automation so that I'm sure that if someone in the company set up any PIM assignments, 
then I'm enforcing the policies uh, that I have in my company. So here are just some examples of running these, uh, this uh, script. On the left side, you can see that I'm uh, assigning some uh, uh, group permissions as legible. Um, on the bottom, you can see that I'm running through all these uh, policies, and there are policies for roles, there are policies for Azure resources. So there are different uh, policies. Um, and uh, on the top, you can see that you are, I'm assigning some of these uh, roles. Uh, to, so these are the managed assignments, you can say. But we all know that we also have the non-managed scenario, where we have the ad, ad hoc, uh, where we just need to set up something and we do it fast without the automation. So, but what I thought of was that making an assignment wizard so that we make sure that everyone in the company can actually set up a PIM assignment using a wizard uh, where you have step one, step two, and so on, that you can set it up. So on the left side here, you can see, you can start off this PIM assignment wizard, and you choose what is it that I want to assign. So is it like a PIM assignment for a group or for an admin? So is it a role assignment? Uh, is it an assignment to an AU? Is it an assignment for an Azure resource? Uh, is it PIM for groups? So I choose what type of role assignment or assignment it is. And here in the step two, I've chosen that is for Azure resources, and now it lists all my management groups and subscriptions in my environment. And I choose the, the, uh, the environment. At the bottom here, I choose is it for an admin account or is it a group? And moving on, you choose it. And lastly, you choose the policy around it. And here you can add, of course, the different policies that you want, like 180 days, 365 days, and so on. And then you click the OK button, and it creates it for you. So this is a way to do this uh, uh, in, a, in a cool way. When we have this, when we both have a menace and an unmenace uh, set up, we also need to make sure that we have a good overview of all the assignment and this is where it is really hard in the portal today and this is where a lot of us are struggling and um, I think the worst thing right now is that if you go into an RBAC setup in a normal RBAC in your uh, the portal you cannot see all the eligible permissions so so the GUI itself is uh, making it a little hard for us right now because you only see the permanent and you have to, to click for the electable elsewhere. I know it is something that are working on from a feedback perspective, but it's not possible today. So this is an example of me dumping all the permissions out in a simple spreadsheet form where you can see a list form at the bottom here, and then you can see some pivots over here where you can mix things around and see who has what permissions uh, and what roles uh, in my environment. What I've also built is an assignment revoker, which is basically taking all the assignments and you can go into this, uh, say, okay, what do you want to uh, revoke? Is it like a role assignment, an Azure resource? And when you click into this, you can do multi-select, so you just could click each of the ones that you want to remove and click OK, and then it uh, removes or, and revokes all the assignments. So that is also something which can be uh, helpful. So let me just go over here and show it. So let me see here. So here we have the, let me just see. This is the assignment wizard. I've just started up here where I'm going to start up and do an assignment of a role. And uh, let's say I want to do, uh, for example, SharePoint uh, to an admin. And I go down and find the person that I want to assign it the permission to, eligible, and then it will assign this role. 
as you can see here, it's pretty simple, but it is using the standard. It's using the naming conventions. It doesn't, um, it, it doesn't, it takes all the predefined groups and it, it makes it pretty easy for anyone in the company to do this uh, in a fast way. And, um, uh, and again, you can run it and uh, at, for either an admin or a group and, and it will work. So, and the other thing that I have here is the revoker, uh, which is, let me just find that window. Here we have the revoker and where you have all the permissions that are in here. And you can see here that I have uh, some assignments and maybe I wanna and uh, remove this permission here and I do like this. And now it has revoked that permission. Uh, so a big picture where you can actually uh, uh, get and remove things uh, very easily uh, from the environment. <clears throat> I think this is, could be helpful to you. Yeah. That's something that I have seen uh, a lot of my customers are really happy about because they are struggling a little bit to uh, to to the clicking around and uh, and it's uh, it's uh, not easy for them. So let's uh, try to to go into this and see the different roles that I have here. So again, here we have an example of an environment where we have some delegations of the different groups that you saw before. Um, and uh, let's say that I want to activate the roles uh, that I have been assigned. Um, um, I want to activate that. And now it's going to activate the global roles that I have been uh, that has been assigned to me, that is uh, defined in here. And, uh, and it's uh, pretty easy, uh, the, the concept of it. One of the questions that I received from one of my customers was that, Morten, these namings are, you know, admin friendly, but not user friendly. And, and uh, he really wanted to to get like aliases. So for example, for end user, this is for the HR application, or this is for the ERP application. But at the moment, I have not found a way to, to do that from the, the portal. But what we could do is actually exposing that is giving each of these assignments an alias, uh, and then making a front end to this uh, to the end user. So when they activate this, they would see like HR system or ERP system, or I'm now you can do this change in the, in the, in the power of BI, uh, and you can activate that. So you could have a front end that would uh, do this in a, in an alias uh, way, uh, which I find could be really cool. And, and again, now that I've activated this, a set of roles. I have all these uh, roles that has been delegated to me and I can go in and activate it. So again, the group naming here is very important as uh, it is of course uh, something that we need to make sure that we can understand from the naming what things am I being uh, activating. And um, right now, um, uh, yeah, so th that's how it is. <clears throat> so one of the things that I have promised you that I wanted to show is also around the uh, PIM for AD. And this is something that I find could be really cool to build, uh, where um, using Entra ID as initiator for activating permissions in my AD environment. So. What you can see here is a kind of a, a sync, but it's not doing actually a sync to be honest. So what it does, it, it's very important to understand that this group is, a, or it comes from the, the ID, the intra ID environment. And I create a separate group 
inside the AD. So there's no syncing going on of this. Uh, it is two separate groups, but it's just a naming to the sync to AD, where I know that this group should be created in my AD environment as well. And since I have a naming convention for the admin accounts, which are similar, then I know that this user who initiated this has this naming convention. And the same group, the same user in my AD environment should be the one that I manage. So I'm actually managing the membership of a group in AD with a user, an admin in AD, using my intra ID uh, uh, environment. And uh, here's an example where I'm activating, for example, I need to change the DNS on all my servers using a script, for example. So I go into my intra ID and then I initiate uh, being a local admin on all the servers. I'm not a domain admin, I'm just a local admin on all the servers. So I'm going to activate that using my intra ID. And then what happens is that there's a sync routine that picks up this change and, and, and it will automatically make the user a member of the group for the amount of time that I define in my intra uh, session. So if I chose uh, one hour, then it would say one hour in here or 60 minutes in here. Uh, so it will give that uh, user a permission. And what I use here is a feature inside Active Directory, which is something called, um, so it's part of the Windows uh, 2016 forest mode. So inside the 2016 forest mode, what you can do is that you can it will, you can enable a pump feature um, where you can actually make uh, it looks a little hard here to read I'm sorry I have to change that but here you can see it says member of time to live so I'm actually adding the user into the group for 60 minutes and then after 60 minutes it, it will be taken out by the domain controller if the customer is not running 2016, my script will also work because I'm basically just pulling, adding and removing the user to the group. But in case that my script for some, this member time to live will do the job. It will take out the user from the group, uh, as long as you in your environment. Uh, that's typically what I see sometimes, but, uh, but if you are with 2016 and above, you can go ahead and enable this, uh, and it will add more features to it, but that's the key feature for this. So, as you can see here, while it loops through, it will go in, and see how many seconds are left in the time to live from the pin session and compare it with the AD session. And in this case, it, it never, it's never the same second. Uh, there's always some different, uh, difference uh, in there. Uh, but what I do is that I see, so if it's uh, in this case, uh, 29 seconds, it is acceptable. What I do here is that, <clears throat> If it deviates with more than plus minus two minutes, then I do a resync of the time from the PIM session and resets the time to live in the AD session so that it is aligned. In this case here, you can see that there's a, a big difference. So it automatically goes in and, and, and resets the, uh, the membership. So when the time expires or the uh, admin goes into the PIM and uh, deactivates the assignment, then the admin is automatically being removed from the group as well. So let's just see this in action. So what I'm now trying to do is to connect to this uh, group, uh, to this server here as my admin and I have not activated any permissions right now so it should deny my access so let's do that 
and it tries and it will not be happy. So what you can see here, I have just started this session here at the bottom. Normally it runs in a secure session and uh, the whole the communication inside this is handled by a group managed uh, service account. So there's a group managed service account which handles this, the security around this uh, so that it is uh, secure. But here you can see that it's right now uh, checking up on the membership between these things. And uh, let's try to, to activate this. Uh, let's see here. We want to do, for example, here the local server admins. Yes. hit it right where it went through. You can see here, it activated the session. Now the user or the admin is a member. We can go in and check. See, there's a deviation. When you hit right the session, it, it will come out like this. And now if we click, we should be able to access it. But now we have access to the server, but if I go into my domain, then you can see here I'm missing the new button because I'm just a local admin on the server, but I'm not a domain admin because I didn't activate that permission. So if we go out again and do another PIM session, And let's say that I want to, to activate the uh, domain. Let's try to find that one. Domain admins, here we go. As you can see here, <clears throat> I don't see the enterprise group because right now I'm logged in with a tier one account and not a tier zero account. So if I log in with a TCR account, I would see the uh, permission so I can activate the enterprise admin. And now it is activating this and let's, well, what? Seems like there's a window on top of it. Let me. Then I guess we have to kill this. Let me just start the this one here and log in again. Just need to get my password. Come on, there we go. We're all friends here. The server is connected to a database uh, in Amsterdam. There we go.
And let's try to connect again. And public IP. So now we can see some that it's now showing me that it has two rows. The first one was the local server row, and the other one down here is the the uh, domain admin row. So now it has both groups. So when we go into our session here and go into our AD, we should now be having the new button. So now I'm logged in because I go in and remove this permission uh, again. The thing is that there is a five minute limit of when you enable a PIM session. So uh, I'm not sure that we, we are there yet, but uh, you can see here it says 34. And uh, right now we are 38, so we are in a four minute limit. But once uh, that will do and we remove the, do a deactivate, then uh, it will remove the permission automatically. So that's how it works. Um, and I just want to uh, continue on here, wrapping up things. This is the uh, access review things uh, where we can get the uh, set up some access reviews. What I really like about the access review part is that it will actually have a feature where it will calculate who was um, uh, who has activated some of these roles. And in case that you have delegated this role, it will actually come out with some recommendations saying remove or approve uh, to this. So it will actually look at the number of activations. So again, how many role assignments uh, can we have in a, in a, in an environment uh, today? Anyone know? What? Five, six, seven. Yeah. So, I, to my knowledge, the uh, the number that the the documentation show is five hundred. So, when you when you create the groups, you have to consider about how many, uh, which of the groups should be role assignable? Because there is a limit in the tenant right now of 500. So you get one of these here uh, afterwards. So I can't get to that. Another thing that I want to make sure is remember the length of the group. So if a group needs to be synced over to your AD, it will only handle uh, 63 characters. Uh, and uh, in, when it comes to the intra groups, you have a, a, some larger groups, but uh, I think uh, also make sure that you don't need to scroll too much uh, when it comes to the naming. So use some, uh, some good uh, acronyms that works. Um, uh, the members of the AUs can be both dynamic and assigned uh, uh, users or uh, devices. Um, it's very important, as I said, to when that you implement some uh, governance or some policies and and have some automation around the policy. Nothing out of the box that that handles that. When you create the uh, groups for these uh, PRGs, uh, then make sure to add the owners uh, to these uh, groups because then you can use it for your access reviews uh, later on. Uh, which I find is really good. Also, consider to use some approval process. So, for example, when you activate a global admin or you activate a global role admin, maybe consider to have someone in your organization that will actually uh, activate it. Another thing is, of course, to uh, communicate the why around this. Uh, why are we doing this? Uh, uh, 
I, I know that uh, typically when I come out to a customer, the admins have too much, too many rights. So now we're taking rights away from them. And and if you do uh, so often, I talk with the uh, the IT department and the CIOs and and the, the HR around what are the the job role, what are the tasks. Uh, where How would you want to make sure that they have the right education uh, when they when they are fitting into the new uh, world here? And also, uh, when we have to delegate it, someone will feel that they are losing something that they were having uh, access to before. Another thing is that uh, I also see that when it comes to choosing departments or roles. Um, some of the times uh, I see that it also, uh, that the maturity of the IT uh, organization uh, shows a little bit about if they are maybe less mature, then they are tend to use department way to, to describe themselves. Whereas if they're more mature, maybe larger organization, more international, they are using uh, other wordings like roles, like uh, DevOps, uh, platform operations, SecOps, uh, that's at least how I see it. Of course, start simple uh, and then use these levels uh, to, to, to make it more specific. And again, the governance side of it, to use the revoker, use the exporter feature, use the access review features, uh, I think that's very important. And again, make sure that Everything is being delegated through PIM. Um, remember the emergency access, and uh, lastly, the separate admin account. So I think these are the things that I want to uh, say to you guys. So lastly, I just want to show some links here uh, at the bottom. That is for the presentation. If you want to have a copy of that, there's a lot more documentation. Uh, in the presentation about how to enable this, uh, how is the DMMC set up, um, how is the, uh, uh, how do you, do you uh, change the permissions on the admin SD uh, holder uh, container in your AD, everything is documented in the presentation. So if you need to speak with some CISO guy or something, it is uh, documented in there as well. <clears throat> and yeah, feel free to reach out to me or Connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, I would love to connect with you guys. All right. Specifically for the tier zero um, privileges, or the your service statement, which is to start doing the AD piece, to actually spawn a public access workstation uh, as an potential to actually respond. Yeah. That would be a difficult tool to do that. So you have got security, you've got granularity of the permissions, but you then don't have protection about someone else Exactly. That's uh, it's also part of the ramp model, uh, so that you want to make sure that that you have a secure machine by connecting as a tier zero. I cannot do that from my own machine. I have to do it from a specific IP range or a set of uh, uh, machines. And, and I think that your idea about doing that with a, with a virtual machine, AW, uh, you know, virtual desktop is really cool uh, and like that. Uh, and that's how we also do it, uh, to, to make sure that you can only do that from specific machines. And the same goes also for us uh, in the beginning, in the middle here. You wanna also want to have uh, some uh, special machines for the developers uh, where you are locking down these things uh, so they're not using their own machines maybe to do the development and, and they do it from uh, some virtual machines that are locked down uh, to a certain distinct as well. So I didn't have time to cover that part in the machine, but that's also very crucial in the whole tiering aspect, how you lock down the your servers and, and do that. So I agree. It's in the PowerPoint. <laughs> Good. The documentation is Yeah. Um, of course, <laughs> All right.
Look, um, it's been a long session, but thank you very much for that knowledge. Um, it looks like there might be some giveaways here. What's your yeah. criteria? Giveaways. <laughs> yeah. First in, best dressed. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right. Well, um, look, if you guys are hanging around, maybe ask more than a few questions. Um, or we'll hang around until the top of the hour. We've got to make a move to go back to the day job at your desk. Um, please feel free to make a move. Otherwise, thank you very much, Jen. Yeah. So you get to pick.